All right, well, listen, we begin now with a, f a first talk by uh, Stephen Beller. And it's a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome him and to introduce him uh, uh, today. I think he's one of the best writers I know of uh, about Austrian uh, history. His most recent book is called The Habsburg Monarchy, 1815 to 1918. It's in the series of the approaches, new approaches to uh, European history. I understand he's going to present it uh, tomorrow night at the Shakespeare uh, a book bookshop, so you can go uh, pick up your own copy uh, when you get up there. But it really is a splendid synthesis, and it comes in the wake of a huge phase, a new phase in the historiography about this period, and he's been able to, to incorporate that uh, into his work. He's author of many things. Uh, I want to mention two, which I really think had a huge effect on the historiography of Vienna 1900. One of them is his major book, uh, which is called uh, Vienna and the Jews, 1867 to 1938, a cultural history, which really fundamentally changed the way we look at things. But he also edited a book, uh, which is called Rethinking Vienna 1900, which has also had a big uh, impact there. The, the final book of his is my favorite one, which is called, I think it's The Concise History uh, of, of Austria, uh, which, is, which is great fun, and I recommend it to to everybody to read. Uh, having lived here as a, as a stranger, I keep coming back to it. And every time I find something, I said, bingo, he has got it right. Uh, in other words, the insights and the humor uh, in this concise history are really, uh, are really wonderful. So Stephen, thanks for coming. And uh, welcome to the first uh, salvo, shall we say, in this, uh, in this conference. Um, I, I, can't, I can't live up to that, so I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, carry on anyway. Um, you will note um, many echoes already. We're, the conference has just begun, and uh, we're, there'll already be many echoes in what I say today uh, from what uh, Emil, Emil and Tom have already, have already said, and in fact from the film. Um, so I suppose, I suppose that's a good thing. Uh, we'll, let's see. So the... Uh, so we meet here a couple of days after the centenary of the armistice of the 11th of November, which is being com commemorated globally for its immense significance for, for world history as the day in 1918 that the war to end all wars, the First World War, ended. Because it really didn't, as, as, as uh, Emil kind of hinted, uh, but nonetheless. Um, however, if we want to look for lessons for today's world order, it is not... Uh, not 11th of November that is the most useful date in, for 1918. That was simply the end of a catastrophic war, and I, or not even, and I think very few of us, with some possibly cataclysmic exceptions, need to learn the lesson that world wars are bad. Um, so that's not, an, that's not too, e too difficult a, a lesson to learn. Um, <clears throat> If you, if you want to look at the adverse consequences that followed the armistice of the 11th of November, you're better off looking at 1919 and the decisions made at the Versailles Peace Conference, where many lessons of what not to do and some of what, what to do are relevant to today's world order. Similarly, if you wish to look at, at the lessons uh, resulting from the overthrow of the Russian Empire of Bolshevism, uh, the relevant date is in November, admittedly, but in November 1917. The most significant event in November 19, 1918 that has lessons for today has two centenaries either side of the 11th of November. The, the 3rd of November, when the Habsburg monarchy signed an armistice with the Italians and the Western Allies, and the 12th of November, when the declaration of German Austria as a republic effectively meant the end of the monarchy entirely, although that had it already been clear since before the 3rd of November. Um, Hungary had uh, basically seceded from the monarchy, I think, what, 1st of November? Yes, basically, yes, okay. So the monarchy was already over as a, as a multinational, uh, as you saw on the, scre on the, um, the, uh, the, the clip. Um, the main event of 1918, which has lessons for us today, is the collapse and disappearance of the Habsburg monarchy and its replacement, long before, not long before Versailles, by a set of... Um, what purported to be nation-states. 
Uh, as you might guess from my recent work, the Habs thank you, Tom, the Habsburg monarchy 1815 to 1918, I do not think that this sequence of events, the destruction of a dynastic polyglot, cobbled together supranational state and its replacement by supposedly modern nation states, as the sort of positive lessons that it once was held to possess. Once upon a time, and probably still in many textbooks in the region, the getting rid of an old, fusty, feudalism-ridden empire that was the prison of the nations in favor of a set of sovereign, democratic nation states uh, where the people ruled was, as it was in the immediate aftermath of the First World War, regarded as a very good thing, a positive lesson showing how nation states were the modern solution to all political problems of representation and legitimacy. On further consideration, however, as, uh, as was uh, uh, intimated, historians in recent decades have come to a completely different, indeed reverse view, that the end of the monarchy was a complete disaster for the region and for Europe more generally, replaced by nation states that were not real nation states but were run as if they, as if they were to almost everyone's detriment except extremist nationalists and eventually fascists. And I'm also of this view. <clears throat> the Habsburg monarchy was a positive factor in Central European and indeed European history, and its disappearance therefore a bad result for the continent, and a lesson for today's world order, world order of what not to do. This was not only true on the practical level, where there is a diplomatic European necessity for the great power system, or when it came to its domestic situation, operating as a mediating polity for the many different ethnic groups, nationalities within its borders. Um, just, I mean, uh, you, you all realize this, this strange word nationalities when, when it comes to the Habsburg monarchy, right? They're ethnic groups, they're, they're, they're national, but they're not nations, they're nationalities in, in the Habsburg context. Uh, it's also true on a higher, more abstract level, because with the monarchy's collapse, a whole way of thinking was temporarily compromised that is absolutely necessary for any self-respecting world order, including ours. As I said, fortunately, it was only temporarily compromised, this, this way of thinking, for a couple or so decades, and came back strongly thereafter, but recent trends suggest that this particular modus operandi, or even Weltanschauung, this attitude to political organization that the monarchy so strongly represented is once more under attack, and the lesson of the negative results of the monarchy's loss needs to be reinforced to make sure that the same mistakes are not made yet again. Allow me briefly uh, to outline the basis of the first practical lesson which the monarchy's demise in 1918 has for today's world order. Don't break up complex entities just because they have a few flaws here and there, such as the European Union, to be discussed later, I believe, um, and, un, uh, and are not as decisive or co coherent as some simpler model, because you really, because, to, as the song says, you really don't know what you've got till it's gone. There were many practical benefits in having the monarchy as a large supranational power in Central Europe. As Charles Ingreo has well out, outlined, for centuries, the Habsburg dynastic power had acted as a balancing factor in the European diplomatic system, first as emperors of the, of the Holy Roman Empire based on their imperial soft power and the harder power of the armed force based on the resources of their extensive territories. In the first half of the 19th century, the Austrian Empire under the guidance of Prince Clemens Metternich took an active leading role in the effort to have both a system of diplomatic order in Europe, the Congress system, and a balance of power where Austria had a central role in maintaining the equilibrium of the powers between, between France and the rest, and also and especially between Britain and Russia. This central role fade, faded from the 18, 1830s and was upended by the revolutionary events in 1848 and the series of wars that followed, Crimean, Franco-Austrian, Austro-Prussian, and Franco-Prussian. After 1867, the now dual monarchy was only a shadow of its former self as a player in the great power system, but it was still regarded as a necessary factor in the balancing of power on the continent by no less than Otto von Bismarck, the main reason why Bismarck, uh, hence, was so lenient on the monarchy after handing it the humiliating defeat of 1866. The Habsburg power played this role, and it relied on its status as a quote-unquote European necessity all the way into the First World War, until the complete obeisance to Prussia, Germany, after the Austrian Canossa of the Spa meeting of May 1918, which itself was due to, a, to the covert attempts by the Austrians to have a separate peace with the French and the Allies, 
took away the main rationale for the preservation of the monarchy. Up until, up until then, this had made the Western allies back away from any serious support and encouragement of the breakup of the monarchy by its domestic and nationalist critics in exile. <clears throat> Without independence, however, the monarchy was no longer a balancing factor, so it was held to be dispensable in a way it hadn't been before. Hence its breakup. The subsequent, um, the subsequent history of Central Europe, indeed the world, showed that having a substantial power in Central Europe, and not just a collection of small or middling nation states, was if not entirely indis indispensable, at least a very good idea. As the vacuum created was filled first by Nazi Germany, 1939-1945, and then the Soviet Union, Russia, from 1945 to 1989, with appalling consequences for the region and the world. Well, from 1948, I suppose, we, we understand. Um, not only was the disappearance of the monarchy bad for the balance of power, it was also terrible for the security of the various national groups of the region, as the nation state successors to the monarchy did not have the inertial mass to protect them from the great powers of Germany and Russia, apart from the fact of being almost constantly at each other's throats throughout the interwar period. The role of the monarchy as a protective haven for the small nations of Central Europe had been recognized by many before 1914, including the old emperor Franz Josef himself, and, and famously the Czech founder of Austro-Slavism, Franciszek Palacki. The Hungarian agreement to the Compromise of 1867 was also at least partly due to the consideration that having half, or more indeed, of the power in the monarchy was far better than having all of no power as a tributary of either Germany or Russia, uh, which was the pro and Russia being the proper alternative. The events after 1918, especially after 1945, uh, proved this by default. As well as providing the population security against the more powerful neighbors, the framework of the monarchy was also a positive factor for the economic prosperity and cultural and intellectual levels of the populace, whatever their language or nationality. It is true that the monarchy became hamstrung by its nationality conflicts, and this, as was mentioned, and the associated constitutional tri tribulations caused by the imper imperial royal relationship between imperial Austria and royal Hungary after 1867, where the emperor and king often clashed on issues despite being the same person. The reactionary absolutism of Metternich's system in the first half of the 19th century suppressed political activism, either liberalism or nationalism, by the populace as much as it could not as successfully in Hungary as elsewhere, admittedly, but did not actually suppress cult cultural nationalism, indeed saw it as a way to satisfy national values within the context, context of a polyglot multicultural empire. It turned out cultural nationalism was the midwife of political nationalism, but the authorities only realized that far too late. The revolutions of 1848 were partly a liberal attempt to gain popular rep representation and control over government, but also a clear attempt to create national popular government for the various national groups of the monarchy, of which there were many and of a varied character and composition, but all based on the romantic notion of the, the people, the folk, as the cultural and spiritual basis on which politics and power should be organized. It was quite easy for the Habsburg power to reassert itself against these liberal and national forces, once it had kind of regained its, its um, uh, self-confidence, because they were inherently in conflict with each other as much as with the Habsburg power. On top of that, the peasantry, still at this point by far the largest part of the population, looked as much to the Habsburg state as a protector from noble predations as they responded to liberal and national slogans of freedom or national independence. <clears throat> the 20-year crisis from 1848 to 1867 saw the monarchy sent to the second rank of great powers and split in half. Austria, Hungary. But internally, what eventuated from this crisis worked well enough. It was still not all that modern in important respects. There was never any acknowledgement in the Austrian half of the monarchy of popular sovereignty, for instance. The December constitution was officially given by the grace of the emperor. It was also beset, especially after the Badeni crisis of 1897, by crippling national and social conflicts in both halves of the monarchy, if in different forms. However, another way of seeing this is as the Habsburg authority is successfully responding to and mediating and coping with its national linguistic and ethnic diversity within the monarchy's frame. In Austria, the German liberal era of the 1870s provided a full rule of law 
a heavy investment in education, and a laissez-faire economy. The Tafel Iron Ring empowered the other political and national groups, largely excluded under German liberal hege hegemony, providing a more multinational, multilingual context. This all blew up in 1897 on the political level, but formative informal compromise were achieved. The net result was that many diverse, often antagonistic groups could work together one way or, another, or the other and be, as a whole, and for each group, very productive. The standout example being the successful politics of the bazaar of the Ernst Kerber ministry of the first years of the 1900s. The Hungarian case was different, with Magyar hegemony continuing to suffocate the political power of the national minorities, which was half the population of Hungary. And this was a problematic contrast to the Austrian experiment. Nonetheless, overall, the monarchy survived quite handily after 1867 and brought its populace quite high levels of prosperity and domestic security. The monarchy was, <coughs> and here, here the, I'm echoing what Emil just said, the monarchy was a free trade area, a single market, if you will, with a monarchy-wide currency with the usual positive economic effects so that Austria-Hungary was catching up quite rapidly with Western Europe in terms of per capita income and wealth in the 1900s. And the gradient between the more prosperous and poorer regions was less than that of modern, sta modern states, such as the United States of America. There, was still, uh, well, there were still ample holdovers of feudal relations, especially in Galicia and Hungary. Yet in Austria, the Habsburg central bureaucracy spread out over the whole of the Austrian half of the monarchy, providing relatively efficient and honest, uncorrupt administration to the public uh, less corrupt uh, and, and, and more efficient, certainly, than the bureaucracies of states to the south and east, or even to the southwest. The parallel bureaucracies of the provincial assemblies with different competencies were also relatively honest, although the inefficiencies of having this dual-track system were becoming most burdensome to the state budget by 1914. The independent Hungarian bureaucracy was actually more centralized than the Austrian one, and more politicized, but also fairly efficient. Both halves of the monarchy, more fully in the Austrian half perhaps, but also in Hungary, had a strong rule of law with an independent ju judiciary that was be behind many of the changes in policy in Austria that led to the non-German nationalities gaining more rights and hence power. Now, one might think Ste Stefan Zweig's idea of the, the age of security as being a touch new, too nostalgic, given the various ethnic conflicts and hate hatred, especially the success in Vienna itself of an openly anti-Semitic party, the Christian Socials. Yet, compared with what came after, the nostalgia is understandable. And we have not even considered the remarkable cultural and intellectual achievements that the peoples of the monarchy produced around the turn of the 20th century, which, when it was, as we, as we see now, at the center of the thought that informs our modern world. There were complicated reasons for these achievements, but one of them was simply the extensive and relatively effective education system that had been introduced under neo absolutism uh, ironically, and then uh, liberalism in the 1850s and 1860s, spurred on, ironically, by nationalist competition over schools and higher educational institutions. The pre-1914 monarchy was, in fact, doing quite well as a state and for its peoples in practical terms. Kind of day-to-day um, right, um, -day terms. In the years leading up to 1914, most crucially perhaps with the Bosnia annexation crisis of 1908, then the crisis in Habsburg prestige and status caused by the two Balkan wars of 1912 and 1913, and then the emergence of a strong Serbia, the monarchy's leadership became caught up, one could say obsessed, by the irredentist threat of South Slav nationalism. That was the threat of the South Slav parts of the monarchy Bosnia-Herzegovina, but also large parts of both Hungary and Austria, breaking away or being taken away by the new South Slav national champion, Serbia. Whether this was a rational response to the actual situation or not, based as it was on dynastic considerations of prestige and status, the strong sense emanating from Franz Josef, for instance, that the monarchy had to retain the status of a great power for the sake of his Habsburg prestige and honor, it led to the colossal mistake of declaring war on Serbia in the summer of 1914. That was a colossal mistake. However, the collapse of the monarchy 
or the breakup of the monarchy, whether it could have been averted or not, was an even more ca catastrophic mi mistake, in my view. The post-1918 uh, post crisis crises would have been difficult in any case because of the traumatic effect of war. But the dis disappearance of the, unif of, in fact, of virtually almost total war, but the disappearance of the unifying monarchy, the splitting up of the large economic units into many inefficient, mutually hostile ones, was a disaster, leading to economic dislocation, endemic economic crisis, and a fairly rapid rush to social and political conflict. And then the emergence of reactionary authoritarian and then fascist regimes through most of the region, even, even before the Nazi German and the Soviet, Soviet Russian tidal waves came through. No wonder, given Central European history after 1918, that a certain nostalgia for the mon monarchy, as evidenced most famously in the literature of the Habsburg myth, emerged quite powerfully, was evident in the 1980s, and is still evident in films such as Grand Budapest Hotel, um, which I'm sure many of you have, have seen uh, uh, here. It's no coincidence, by the way, that the film is dedicated to the memory of Stefan Zweig, the author, indeed, of The World of Yesterday and of The Age of Security. Um, <clears throat> I'm usually very suspicious of nostalgia, and I don't mean to be nostalgic, and I think it is correct to be skeptical of nostalgia, even when it concerns the Habs of monarchy, so I agree even on that respect, in that respect. As already mentioned, the monarchy was far from perfect as a multinational polyglot polity still with strong hierarchical and anachronistic elements that did not serve the monarchy's purpose anymore. The fact that popular sovereignty was never actually acknowledged before the 12th of November 1918 is just the tip of the iceberg of ways in which the monarchy was an imperfect vessel for its mission. In that sense, the European Union is a far superior model, based as it is on the idea of po pooling together the popular sovereignty of many individual democratic nation states. It sometimes not, does not appear that way, especially to Englishmen, apparently, but the EU is a bottom-up multilateral polity, whereas the monarchy was theoretically a top-down, bisected py pyramidal structure, um, even if in practice it operated a similarly, similarly as a multilateral polity. Many liberal pluralist nation states, such as the United States of America, and dare I say the United Kingdom, also were much better structurally than the monarchy because of the more representative democratic nature of their organization based on popular sovereignty and a civic national identity. <clears throat> One of the reasons the monarchy failed was it was never able to achieve legitimacy on this popular basis, partly because the monarch, Franz Josef, chose not to. Nonetheless, nonetheless, the monarchy can serve as an example of the advantages of a particular way of thinking that is different from the normal Westphalian nation state. Uh, this Habsburg or Austrian idea was inclusive, not exclusive, multilateral rather than bilateral, certainly not unilateral as nationalism ends up being. The monarchy operated on the basis of the Austrian idea as something which was the countervailing principle to us versus them, which as George Orwell pointed out as early as 1945, in his brilliant essay, Notes on Nationalism, one of many of course, but a very brilliant essay, is an approach which always leads nationalism to be exclusive and reject compromise and the realities of human relations. This Austrian state of mind, if you like, goes back in European history a long time before the monarchy of 1918, and is clearly evident in the divided sovereignty and complex checks and balances of the later Holy Roman Empire, for instance. <clears throat> the underlying logic was not the normal one of the law of the excluded middle, of binary logic, in other words, of either or, but rather that of the law of the included middle, of both and. One can, all, one can draw up a whole page of such antinomies, but, and I, I won't bore you with it, I have it in my pocket if you wish, but anyway, um, but for now, let me just mention a couple. The concept of difference, where difference excludes, compared to the idea of diversity, where diverse characteristics are the ground not of rejection, but appreciation and inclusion. Or the idea of the need, or the idea of the kind of nationalist idea of the need for a strong and certain decider in chief, uh, compared to a leader who appreciates the uncertainties of policy and is wary of the long-term consequences of misbegotten uninformed, rash decision-making, especially when starting wars. 
if you if you hear any echoes of of, of recent American politics, you you might you might uh, be correct. Um, the monarchy, of course, has many examples of rash decision makers, notably the young Franz Josef. But the existential situation of the monarchy always seemed to end up looking towards the possibilities of compromise with complex, multifaceted solutions and incomplete and hence open systems. <clears throat> Hugo von Hofmannsthal had this sort of complex Austrian diversity in mind when he tried during the First World War to get Anton Wildgans to write a poem praising Austria. He suggested to Wildgans that he should stress the quote, quote unquote, beside each other, in each other, living with each other, end quote, that characterized the organic synthesis of German and Slavic being of Austrians. Wilgans, be it noted, which is perhaps ironic given what, what he, Wilgans later wrote, Wilgans uh, refused to write such a poem because he wanted to insist on the clear hegemony of Germans within Austria. So in other words, the, German, I, the Austrian idea was not always shared by everyone within Austria as the strength of nationalist movements indeed showed, not only German, Czech, etc. One culturally significant aspect of this complex, open-ended diversity was that the citizens of the monarchy were quite able to have more than one identity. <coughs> Try as nationalist politicians might, the national identities of many, if not most, people in the monarchy remained fluid and complex without the monolithic certainties of being Czech or, Ger or German or Czech or Magyar, or Magyar for that matter. One group for which this more open approach to identity in the supranational monarchy was most pertinent, at least in theory, was, as you might have guessed from the, um, the film clip, Habsburg Jewry. <coughs> Joseph S. Bloch, Joseph Samuel Bloch, a, a rabbi and a great enthusiast of the Austrian idea, summed this up by saying, that whereas the members of the various nationalities of the monarchy thought of themselves as German Austrians, Czech Austrians, Polish Austrians, <clears throat> only the Jews, as a religious and not a national group, at least according to Bloch, could think of themselves as Austrians sans phrase, Austrians without qualification. <clears throat> the actual situation among Jews in the Habsburg monarchy was actually much more complicated than that with many Jews wanting desperately to integrate, even fully assimilate, into one of the various national societies and cultures to the point of diving under, as Herzl put it. Whereas others were determined to be fully acculturated, to, uh, to fully acculturate and yet retain a Jewish identity, religious, intellectual, ethnic, secular, cultural, or just familial. And others happily continued in very traditionalist lifestyles quite different from the surrounding society. But the point here is that all these diverse approaches were possible within the monarchy's context. This was nowhere near as acceptable within the logic of a fully nationalist society, in which being Jewish meant logically that you had an identity than, uh, other than the national one, such as German, and hence did not qualify to be German unless the Jewish identification was fully erased. Hence you could come, come up with a question which, uh, which in, in terms of the monarchy is slightly insane, which is where you ask, uh, for instance, was, uh, and this is a, 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 a quote from Serge Zabarsky, but Serge Zabarsky thought this was a clever question, it's not a clever question, was um, Heinrich Heine a German, or was Heinrich Heine a Jew? Was, was, Mendels, was Felix Mendelssohn a German, or was Mendelssohn a Jew? Now the point was, right, in the, within this context, what, what, why, why can't they be both? Right? <clears throat> but in a nationalist context, you can't be. You, if you are other than the, the national group, you are no, not a member of that nation. So, the more inclusive, open, flexible, and adaptable logic that resulted from the monarchy's multilateral, multinational, and polyglot context and history could produce levels of sophistication of thought and what is now called cultural dexterity, which goes a long way to explaining the huge intellectual and cultural achievement of Central Europe at the turn of the century. I also think it is no accident that one of the groups most prominent in this achievement was one of the groups that benefited most from the relatively inclusive uh, approach to, to who belonged and who did not in the society and culture, which was Habsburg Jewry. And indeed, many of those Jewish contributors, such as Bloch, 
encouraged this open, inclusive interpretation of the Austrian idea. That being said, this Habsburg approach was, and here's another echo, was by its very nature complex and vague, indecisive and uncertain, fated not to have the simple, forceful message that other less sophisticated, indeed less complicated, political ideas possessed. Egon Friedel, an exemplary member of the world of, of Vienna 1900, put it well in a review of a performance of King Ottokar's Fortune and End, published in 1st of October 1918 in Der Merkur. Friedel wrote, and I quote, Grillparz's patriotism is, as with Austrian patriotism in general, a problem. For the German, this emotion is summed up in the words Deutschland über alles. For the Frenchman, this, in the sentence Vive la France. These are simple formulae, incapable of misinterpretation. Well, actually, they can be misinterpreted, but anyway. But the Austrian views his fatherland with a sort of Strindbergian love-hate in which the word fatherland itself appears to him as something ridiculous, which he cannot utter without a slightly sarcastic tone creeping in. It was, in other words, just too abstract and etiolated an idea to grab, to grab people by and make them unite behind. And Friedel could be considered to have been proved correct a mere month later, when the monarchy did indeed fall apart on and around the 3rd of November, 1918. <clears throat> Yet the alternative form of national identity, of a decisive unitary nationalism, which is what replaced it all over uh, Central Europe, with it, was it 14 countries you said, Abraham? With its inherently exclusive logic of either or, of us versus them, was then, as, and as is now, disastrous for both the national and international order. By the way, I, I, think, I don't think there's uh, an, over, uh, an overriding distinction between the domestic national structures of a, a, national, a national polity and of a supranational or even global polity, such as the European Union and the United Nations. And given, given the fact that the world has shrunk since 1918 in, in many respects, um, I, th I think uh, the, the, the Habsburg monarchy can be a, a model also for international, semi-international uh, uh, institutions. In that sense, I'm, I'm with Kant, and not Hegel, when it comes to how human relations are ordered. National sovereignty, while a significant concept within the political order, can never be an absolute barrier within the structures of human relations. The monarchy was not unique in its mindset, its way of thinking. There are many other historical examples of such multinational polyglot, po plural polities or empires, even multilingual, that is to say, multinational democracies such as Switzerland, that have similar approaches uh, to their poly polyvalent situation. Yet the monarchy is one of the most productive examples, economically but also culturally and intellectually. It was an example of the sort of multilateral cooperation, both supranational and multinational, that is not only relevant to the way the European Union works today, but also the way the United Nations and the many associated international agencies help the international community coordinate and cooperate uh, on global regulation and policy. As with the monarchy, these multilateral institutions are inherently complex, often appearing inefficient and even self-contradictory in their organization slow and far from, stream, far from streamlined, but they are the guarantors of peace and prosperity and are far more productive and sympathetic to our modern cosmopolitan, multicultural, connected global existence than the other form of modernity, nationalism, was or is. Unlike the latter, they can help with global supranational issues like climate change, epidemic disease, terrorism, migration flows, and international trade and, and the cyber economy, which do not respect borders. Nationalism, or indeed national sovereignty. Nationalism, based on the decisive, divisive logic of either or and vice versus them, was what usurped the place of the monarchy in Central Europe. But it's the multilateral logic of both and, which is the way to a prosperous future within, within states and between them. The modern version of this inclusive logic is liberal, pluralist democracy on the national and the international level. Liberal, pluralist democracy can be, by, defin but by definition, include a very diverse set of values in, in a way nationalism cannot. Now, the logic of either or is the logic we usually use in life. Uh, but, and it does have its place in many aspects of life and politics, in the legal and administrative systems where decisions <coughs> do have to be made uh, eventually. And there are other instances where determining that either this is true or false 
as for instance in videotapes, is salutary for the health of any polity, no matter how complex. But, but, um, but um, the use, the, these uses of either or logic can happily exist within this larger both and, and framework. The lesson of 1918, therefore, is that the, that the liberal pluralist multilateral logic of both and, despite recent developments, remains the only reasonable choice for today's world order, for its sim simplistic counterpart of nationalist sovereignty and international anarchy is a recipe for disaster. To quote um, a politician who is not usually uh, my favorite, there is no alternative. Thank you.